morning to everyone and welcome to the at-large policy session three, ICANN accountability and transparency in the ICANN reviews part two on Wednesday, the 20th of October, 2021 at 1830 UTC. In order to save time, we will not be doing the roll call today. However, attendance will be noted from the Zoom room as well as on the audio bridge. We will have Spanish, French, and Russian interpretation on today's call. If you need a dial out to the Spanish or French lines, as well as the Russian lines, please send a direct message to staff with your preferred language and your phone number. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone to please state your name when taking the floor each and every time, and to please speak slowly and clearly for accurate interpretation. If you would also please keep your microphones muted when not speaking to prevent any background noise. Thank you so very much. With this, I will turn the call over to you, Sebastian. Um, Devon, thank you very much. Uh, we will start the second uh, session and uh, um, I will be short. I want to thank you uh, for participating, to be back here. I want to thank you, thank all the speakers from the first session. I think it gave a, a good overview of uh, the point of view of the different part of ICANN. And now we will see uh, how you react as a participant and hopefully we will be able to find some way for the next uh, phase uh, regarding uh, the reviews in general and the holistic review in particular. And um, with that, I will give the floor and the button to run the discussion and question and answer with the participant to either. And then we will, be, we will have at the end uh, concluding remark by Joran Marby, uh, ICANN president and CEO. And um, I guess he will have the last words. Iser, uh, take the floor, please. Merci, Sebastian. Uh, very good morning, very early morning to you all from Tasmania. I'm, I'm pleased to take over the remainder of the session and, uh, and facilitate. I noticed just as a housekeeping point um, that uh, Leon has made an excellent suggestion in the uh, in the chat, which is that we take the agenda down. Um, there we go. Although I'm much too large for it being uh, so early in the morning um, in your video screen, um, we can see each other's faces. That's uh, that's helpful. Um, I've recorded three questions from the uh, prior session during the speakers' presentations. Um, I'll work through each of those, and then uh, we'll invite anyone else who'd like to, to raise a question of any of our participants or, or indeed a general question to do that. Um, the first question that, that I recorded from, uh, from the previous session was that asked by Holly, uh, Holly Raish. She said, there appear to be two views of the holistic review. Pat Kane talks about the review as looking at the spaces between the SOs and ACs and how they work together. Whereas Steve Del Bianco's view seems to be to look at the structures themselves, or at least a power imbalance. Are both views of a holistic review saying the same thing or reconcilable? I suppose it, it might be helpful to start off with, with Pat and Steve. Um, your thoughts on either of those interpretations um, that, that uh, Holly has noted. Um, either Pat or Steve, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Heather. This is this is Pat Kane, and and I, I put in chat uh, the, a response that basically said that the idea around the holistic review is to be inter SO AC NC, whereas we're not trying to get to be intra SO. And so I think Steve's you know Steve's Steve's uh, specific use case appeared to be around balance or imbalance within the GNSO. So the holistic review would not take a look at that. That would be an evolved organizational review as we recommended to where the GNSO would take on a discrete piece of work and, and, and then uh, attempt to, to come up with some conclusion. Hey, thanks, Pat. Steve Dell Bianco here. I note that in the ATRT3 final report, one of the objectives of the holistic review was the second bullet which said, quote, to review the effectiveness of the various inter-SOAC 
NOMCOM collaboration mechanisms. So Pat, I am uh, looking for an opportunity here. I wanted to seize on that particular interaction mechanism and I'll give an example. Working groups in PDPs and GNSO have of late invited participation from SSAC, GAC, ALAC, and even RSSAC. And we've had the good fortune of their participation for three years on the expedited PDP, the EPDP, on phase one, phase two, phase two A. And uh, that exercise showed that those communities interact in our mechanisms with which some very serious involvement and in bringing to the table ideas, proposals, such as Steve Crocker's proposal on how to handle things like the new field for uh, uh, legal person versus natural person. GAC and ALAC were involved at every single call, as Alan and Hadio would indicate, and then uh, the GAC Public Safety Working Group. So the mechanism of their involvement was as a full-fledged working group member who participated in our mechanism, but they don't participate as a vote in GNSO. You would think their interests could be represented in a more interesting way if GNSO allowed GAC, ALAC, and SSAC to participate in the actual voting that occurs in the GNSO. So Pat, that's an example of how the interaction mechanisms, which was more part of your objectives, would address potential structural issues on making sure that every AC and SO participates in the mechanisms. Thank you. So, so thank you, Steve, and this is Pat again. So, so I understand what you're saying, but that's, that's the objective of what the, organ, what the evolving organizational review for continuous improvement was supposed to be about, is working within that. And each structure can put together a definition of how they want to uh, do their continuous improvement program. But the holistic review, again, was designed or thought through about from, from the perspective of how do we make certain that we are identifying accountabilities and we're identifying responsibilities between the organizations? So again, go back to the space, you know, the white space within the organization. How does how does that flow and how does that work? It was not intended to be a top to bottom A to Z view on everything within ICANN from that type of holistic approach. Yeah, that would feel this Steve Del Bianco, that would feel very unwieldy if it had that monstrous scope. But I wanted to bring up a second mechanism that would not be addressed in the individual organization reviews. And that is the mechanism of how we compose the board of ICANN. And uh, that hasn't been touched in a long time. And the 15 seats, eight of which are appointed by the NOMCOM, and not all of which are voting seats on, on the ICANN board. So for instance, where would it be appropriate to investigate whether GNSO, which is well over 95% of ICANN's revenue and probably 90% of ICANN's workload in terms of policy development, contract enforcement. So GNSO has two seats on the ICANN board. And in terms of representation and balance, uh, a number of us have suggested that the contract parties ought to have two, one for registrars and registries, and the non-contract parties ought to have two, commercial and non-commercial. This would solve a rather arbitrary mechanism where both contract and non-contract parties have to either take turns or select a candidate that is of neither perspective, right? Not such a problem, I think, on the contract party side, but it certainly has been a significant problem, uh, a challenge on the non-contract party house. So that is a second mechanism, Pat, and I'm not anxious to suggest that the holistic review be a top to bottom, full 360 view of ICANN. That would be unwieldy. But I think the two examples I'm bringing up are things that would not be addressed in an organizational review, since the organizational review of GNSO is unlikely to look at the concerns of ALAC, GAC, and SSAC as, a, as stakeholders on GNSO policies. Thank you. So, so Steve, this is Pat again. Thank you for that as well. And I think that your second example is probably more germane to a holistic review than, than the first one is. And I think that each organization, again, from a, from a, a um, continuous improvement program would have those types of mechanisms where they would invite people to come in. And so then the holistic review would take a look at the processes within each of the organizations. And so whoever were to operate the holistic review 
would take a look at a GNS review, GNSO review in the continuous improvement program that they implement and, and, and make, a, make, a, make a suggestion around composition of those continuous improvement reviews. That, that is certainly the first bullet in the objectives that I went through. Now, it wouldn't be to solve the specific problem you're trying to solve, but it would be about addressing the processes that the continuous improvement program would, would be addressing. Now, on the second one, when you talk about the board, the fourth item that we have in our objectives had to do with does the organization or the structure still serve its constituents? And so if you felt that the organization, or the, or sorry, the composition of the board no longer served the constituents, I could see where the fourth objective would be appropriate to use as, as part of that holistic review. Again, I think that the imbalance or the balance that you talked about earlier uh, from the GNSO would not be, but I could see where a discussion around does the board still serve the constituency be subject to the holistic review based upon the fourth objective. This is Heather. Thanks very much to, to both Pat and Steve um, for their additional comments on that. I'm just mindful that we want to try and avoid um, getting to too much of a, of a back and forth between two people and, and open the floor. It is the case that everyone has the ability to raise hands um, and ask uh, and ask a question. Um, at the moment, I'll suggest that we stick with this particular question. Is there anyone that would like to uh, to weigh in via the microphone? um a, on this particular point on on the idea of of this this sort of two i won't say competing but but perhaps two nuanced views of of um uh, of the purpose all right i don't see anything on this particular point um in the meantime what i'd like to do is i'd like to move on to um a question that was raised by christopher wilkinson in the chat in the prior session um who wrote in relation to bylaw amendments he said sebastian's presentation mentioned some changes how is that going to work who holds the pen what is the negotiation and approval procedure for bylaw amendments post transition this is quite a technical point. Um, do we have potentially, I'll ask, do we have a staffer um, on the call who might be able to walk us through the actual mechanics of uh, fundamental bylaws changes? Might need to tee that up in the background. I mean, this is Joran, can I make a comment? Please go right ahead, Joran. I mean, so, Bylaw changes comes from different uh, different parts and there are different inputs. For instance, we have a proposed um, bylaw change from the CCNSO uh, that we are starting the process. Um, and, and sometimes the board proposes bylaw changes like when we, a couple of years ago, uh, added the uh, board technical committee uh, as a board um, as, as a board committee. So the input could come from different uh, different places. The, the outcome is always the same. It goes through a process where the empowered community has the final say and has to agree upon any particular bylaw change. So the, the empowered community, which is a defined entity within ICANN, uh, will always have the ability to, to uh, abide or not you know, reject or do something with the potential bylaw change. That is the real shortcut of this. Uh, and, and I'm trying to strain away from from. I didn't know the, I, I wasn't on the previous uh, conversation, so I don't know what in, in what context that question came up. Um, I hope it answered a part of the question. Thanks, Ciaran. Just by way of, of background quickly, um, it, the, the discussions, Sebastian's presentation, um, uh, if you like, summarized the, the highlights of ATRT3 and some of the recommendations that came out of, of ATRT3 and what would be necessary to uh, to implement those recommendations. And some of them do indeed require uh, bylaws amendments. So it was, it was really a, um, a purely a process question, not one that was uh, generated in, in the context of a particular um, a particular point. Um, Aubrey, I see you have your, your hand up, so we'll turn to you now. <laughs> Thank you, Aubrey speaking. Yeah, just wanted to add one thing to um, to Yoran's description, and that is the step that after 
legal has gone through all the possible wording and, and such, there is a public comment on any bylaws change before the board makes a decision on it. And then yes, after the decision is made on it, then it goes to the, uh, the empowered community. And depending on whether it's a fundamental or regular bylaw, they either have to approve it or have to just allow it. Thanks. And, and now I, I can also add, so for instance, if a review comes in with a recommendation that the board accepts that will give a, a potential bylaw change, the process will be, as, as Avery said, the, there will be a legal proposal that goes for public comment, comes back and, went, and then goes to the empowered community. So input could come from different places. Uh, thanks very much to um, to both Avery and Euron. Um, I'll note before turning to Christopher that uh, Mary Wong has very helpfully posted in the chat, uh, for those of you monitoring the chat, that the process for fundamental bylaws amendments is outlined in section 25.2 of the bylaws and Mary's helpfully provided a link. So thank you, Mary. With that, Christopher, please. Good evening, Christopher Wilkinson for the record. Uh, thank you, that was the fastest uh, cooking and eating of my supper that I've ever been through in the last few, <laughs> few weeks. Um, I asked the question not innocent, innocently. Um, there are, first of all, the, the restrictions in the bylaws uh, over the mandate of um, ICANN are currently being purveyed as an excuse for ICANN to be unable to act quickly and effectively, notably currently on the dossier of uh, DNS abuse, uh, which leads me to review the I the, the bylaws to see what um, would need to be changed in order to, uh, for ICANN, uh, and notably this uh, new entity, DAR or something, um, this new entity to actually uh, take responsibility for, for aspects of DNS abuse. Um, the um, more generally, 20 years ago, the board would propose <laughs> unilaterally changes to the bylaws without any consultation or information to the, to, to the stakeholders, which I once, um, I believe famously, described as a, a rather cavalier approach. That being said, there are aspects of the present situation and notably the credibility of the ICANN multi-stakeholder model internationally, uh, which almost certainly will, will require uh, bylaw changes. So it is important that the community and um, all of us really understand in a practical way um, how it should be done and it needs to be done in a way which does not require hundreds of hours of uh, online negotiation um, in ICANN conference calls. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Marita, we see you have your hand up. We'll turn to you. It's not directly on this issue, so I'll wait till we're done with this issue. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Marita. What I might do then, if you're willing, is I'll put you in the queue because I have one more question from the previous session um, and, and we'll pick up with you after that. Um, any further thoughts on, on this? Any further questions around the, um, uh, the process for, for changing the bylaws? I think it's, it's, the, the process is, is uh, fairly lengthy, um, but nevertheless, I think it's fairly straightforward. All right, I don't see any other hands on this particular point. Um, it, what I would like to do then is um, it, 
again pick up with a question from the previous session. Um, and Jeff Newman asked what he characterizes as a, as a rather provocative point, um, which if I summarize it is, should review implementation ever be prioritized over PDP imp implementation? Um, and there was some discussion in the chat about the, the session that was conducted last week uh, regarding uh, regarding prioritization. I, I wonder, Zabia, if we might bring you in here just to clarify, um, it, it, is it the case that prioritization encompasses reviews and CCWG and PDP, or what is the scope of, of prioritization? Can you set us straight on that, please, before we, we continue with this? Sure. I think you, can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Thank you, yeah. hold on. Apologies for this. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Heather, for the question and for the question in the chat. So to, to clarify on the project that we're currently carrying out of developing a prioritization framework, community-based. Yes, the scope is intended to include both policy in review implementation work and CCWG implementation work for the purpose of ensuring that when decisions are made as to what priorities are, the overall work of the organization is um, relative to implementation is considered because this work, the, the entirety of that scope of work draws on both community resources that are the same and order resources sometimes that are the same. I have heard, however, a number of comments or read a number of comments in the chat that are assuming that as a result of that scope, including, let's say, both policies and reviews, that there would be a single line of sequential work. I don't think that is an assumption we should make. I think that there is parallel work that can happen uh, of implementation uh, for all of us as an ecosystem. And it's not like one policy only can be implemented and only when that is done, then a review can be implemented, et cetera, et cetera. I think that there are obviously possibilities across our overall ecosystem to be able to work on the implementation of a policy, as well as on the implementation of, let's say, WS2, as well as working and planning on the implementation, let's say, of HRT3. By the way, that's what we do today. So, uh, yes, the scope of prioritization project is designed at the moment, based on the current input that we've collected, to be inclusive of all that work. But it's not, it shouldn't be assumed as a result that there will be a single line of work in that necessarily policy implementation it will be in competition with review implementation, though clearly all that scope of work should be taken into account. I hope that helps and I'm happy to further address any question there is down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Zavi, very much appreciated. So we have a queue on this particular point um, that's formed uh, just as you were speaking, Zavi, so we may well come back to you. Uh, first, Christopher, then Jeff, and then Joran. And again, uh, for everyone's reminder, we'll come back to Marita after this particular question. So Christopher, please. Thank you. I, I presume that's this Christopher, because I believe there are more than one around here. Um, look, uh, I just referred to my reply to Jeff in the chat. The PDP, notably subsequent procedures, will be implemented with great slowness, precisely because the dominant parties in the PDP have cooked up a, a document which in certain respects of public policy and international interest is so egregious that most of us outside the uh, contracted parties bubble uh, could not possibly accept it or reject it or, or, or recommend it. Um, I, I've said very clearly, delays are 
being res are the result of the decisions of the majority in GNSO. And that's got to stop. Otherwise, ICANN will be paralyzed. And insofar as it implements some aspects of GNSO policy, it, the whole multi-stakeholder model in ICANN will be criticized and attacked internationally. And that would be a great damage and mistake. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christopher. Jeff, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is Jeff Newman, and, and I'm not going to respond to that. I, I think that the general point was more about um, the result of policy development processes, plural, always should trump review team recommendations. Um, putting aside your feelings on um, the subpro, there's also the RPM phase one PDP. There's the, uh, of course, the asset that's being worked on. There's privacy proxy. There's uh, thick who is. I mean, there's a lot of policies that are still waiting to be implemented, putting aside even, even subpro. So I think the point is ICANN has a very discreet mission. And we, and what I'm always afraid of, and I make this comment probably at least once every five years or so, um, we get to a point where we get so bogged down in reviews and in um, processes and all this other stuff that the fear is we lose sight of what ICANN's mission actually is. And so Xavier, I'm fine if in the prioritization exercise if we want to do sort of two tracks, one for like stuff that relates to substance and our mission, and the other with review team recommendations, that's a possibility. But even the thought of putting them all in the same bucket to me is scary because we have a, a mission and we can never lose sight of what that mission is. Otherwise, we could be the most accountable organization in the world, but if we don't do anything of substance, then who cares, right? I mean, it just doesn't matter. And so the world looks to us to manage and administer the root zone, right? That's number one. If we can't solve the various issues that, that are, are there that are referred to us, it doesn't matter how accountable we are to each other. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I have uh, Joran next. Sorry, listen. I, I, it's hard to, to sort of summarize. So first of all, we have rules, uh, which are set by the community when it comes to uh, the reviews we're doing. And, and uh, four, I think four years ago or whatever, we started talking about the amount of reviews um, that is now, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that we have like 250 review recommendations, um, which, are, uh, which are now to be implemented or reviewed. And if I would ask, um, if I, I mean, I was on a call this morning when the CCT review was uh, brought up as a, you know, something that has to be, my understanding, has to be fully implemented before we can proceed with the next round. Um, and so, so I, I guess that your point, Jeff, we, I don't disagree in general with it. It's just that it, I think it's, it feels a little bit like we're looking for, for someone to sort of say, well, this is wrong, we should do something about it. But the community is actually the one who could do something about it. Remember that there is also the, and I think that Steve pointed out in the chat that the, the way we do bylaw changes is much more fixed order transition. I totally agree with that. I totally agree. That is one of the most fundamental principles that we have a good process for bylaw changes. Uh, because that is something that is you know, fundamental to what I can do. So I agree with the point that you know, it might be discussed and we can change it. My point is really that this is this, this setup is done after the session. I agree with Pat's looking into the holistic review, looking into the, the places where we need to fix an address process that doesn't work or have to improve them or lack of existence of it. But at the end of the day, we need to do the work. And, and the reasons why we set up a department inside ICANN work to, to handle priorities, why the board set up a priority discussion is to have this discussion. So we know this is the amount, it's like when I'm talking to my kids about how much money you're going to get. This is the amount of money we have, and then we have to pay rent, and then it's less than, and this is how much money I can actually give you. Because we 80% of what we do, 90% of what we do every year is the same thing. 
community support, policy support, um, and then we add on the recommendations, we do it. But right now, the catch-up effect. We need to prioritize. And, and I'm looking forward to conversation with the community when you can say, yes, this should be a higher priority than something else, because that's what Xavier is trying to say. That's what we're looking for. The community is saying that this one is more important than that one. That would be a really good outcome of this one. Only remember that when you prioritize something up, you actually do have to re-prioritize something. And right now, the input we're getting from different parts of the community is really, everything has a higher priority. Thank you. Thanks, Joran. Uh, we'll turn to Alan Greenberg, please. Alan. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I have to agree at some level w with Jeff. The the bottom line is if, if we're very cre if we're very accountable but aren't actually doing a significant job at what we're supposed to be here for, we have a problem. Uh, at the other end of the scale, if we are doing a lot of work but are completely uncredible because of accountability, then that work has no value also. So somewhere there has to be a balance. And yes, Joran is right that prioritization is one of the ways of doing it. But I think we also have to step back a little bit and make sure that we are not so worried about process that you know the list of administrative reviews and other things just grow to be so large that we end up spending too much of our time on that. And I, I think ICANN over the years gets more and more process oriented and more and more rules oriented and has lost to a large extent the focus of actually being able to accomplish work in, uh, effectively in reasonable amounts of time. So. Uh, Hopefully, the the uh, the review can look at that aspect also, and make sure that we are still fit for purpose. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. I'd like to pick up a, on a point in the chat before we um, turn it turn the microphone over again. Um, the, the question, I think, there's a dialogue happening in in the chat for those who aren't able to see it. As to if if I summarize, what do we do if we, the community, are not able to agree on uh, prioritization? Um, what happens then mechanically? Um, what what do we do? Um, there's some different views in the chat as to, um, let's say, you know, one SO or AC having a different view from another SO or AC. I think it's also plausible to to think about this from the perspective of within an SO or AC, there there may not be, um, uh, let's say, the the capability to to reach a, a common decision as to as to how things should be prioritized. So what what do we do in that um, in that event? Zavi, I see you put your hand up. We'll turn to you, please. Thank you, Heather, and I, I, I'm not uh, trying to, to turn this session into a topic about prioritization, so happy to, to leave it alone uh, uh, afterwards. But um, I, I think Jeff's point is important to consider, which is how can the, the community uh, all agree on a, on a set of priorities? In, in, I said it differently, the same thing. Prioritizing within the multi-stakeholder model is a very ambitious exercise. We've not really done this before as an ecosystem. We are by structure, by nature, an ecosystem that is open. Every voice counts and needs to be heard. In that context, how do you prioritize? How do you say this topic is more important than this one when we are trying to listen to everyone? So it will not be easy. But... Having said that, should that mean that we don't try to listen, to enable the community to provide a voice as to what we think is more important? There may be things that are seen as either more important or more urgent or needing simply to be done in the different sequence of steps. Uh, and, and therefore, that uh, there is an input that can be valid here, even if that input takes different faces, different uh, flavors. Uh, look at what we do with the public comment process today. 
the community and the various organizations or individuals who provide input into a coming public comment process provide an individual opinion, whether it's of an organization or of a person. And that input creates a, 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 an opportunity for the organization to understand what the community says and thinks and wants about a given topic. So this prioritization process is a little bit like a public comment process, but instead of being individually submitted input, it becomes a conversation in that everyone provides that input and out of that conversation at the very minimum, even if people do not agree with each other as to what priorities are, at least everyone will be better educated as to what another part of the community wants or what another part of the community thinks is important. And as a, as a group, as an ecosystem, we will be better informed about each other and we may have a chance to lying on thinking maybe these five things are more important than these other three things. And therefore, maybe we're going to put a bit more effort into it. It's not going to be easy. But you know what? Every other organization does it, not necessarily with a multi-stakeholder model like we do, but we owe it to ourselves and to the users of the internet to try to be as efficient as we can. And that takes prioritization and we should put the efforts into it. It's not gonna be easy. Thank you. It, thanks, Xavier. I think that's helpful. And, and I do think, um, you know, I, I would certainly suggest that it's not, um, I don't believe that you've taken us off track with prioritization. I think, I think it's important to talk about prioritization because quite frankly, um, it's the, um, uh, it's the, the, the all, all roads lead to prioritization, if you like, and, and all roads lead from prioritization. So I think it's, a, it's an important point. Um, Jeff, I saw you put up your hand um, while Xavier was speaking, so I suspect it's on this point. So we'll turn to you. Yeah, I'll just, I'll make it quick. And, and just to, just to be clear, um, because Xavier, I actually did support you on that notion on the prioritization call that it should be a group comprised of the community that discusses these things amongst each other and not just in silos. I think that's important. I think what is a little bit worrisome to some of us is the fact that the process to figure out how to prioritize will take us another year and a half or two years, according to that big, you know, heavily process oriented um, description of what we have to go through. And I think that might be, uh, there's got to be easier, less time consuming, less resource intensive ways to try out a prioritization exercise. Uh, again, the whole point was, and, and just I remember raising this to Fadi the very day he announced at an ICANN meeting about the IANA transition, where I, I said to Fadi, I said, please tell me this is, this is not going to take up any real time during ICANN meetings so we can actually get the things that we need to get done. You know, two years later and a community that was unable to almost talk about almost anything else, you know, that, that's what happened. So this is my warning again. Um, and like I said, I usually make this warning about once every five years, so it's probably about due, um, which is that we just can't lose sight of what our mission is and what we need to do. And these other things, while important, um, should not distract from things like implementation of PDPs in general. Um, thanks, that's it. Uh, thanks, Jeff and, and Zavi. I think, I think there were some really good points that were made there and, and there's been some added comment in the chat. I, I suppose, um, Jeff, if we distill your comments, it's, it's uh, let's not lose sight of, of core business. Um, but at the same time, it is worth acknowledging, I think, that um, the uh, IANA transition process, which you've identified, Jeff, that uh, it did ultimately end in agreement um, by the community. Um, but perhaps there's a, a point to be made about the time that it that it took. Mind you, it's obvious noted in the chat that um, that's certainly not the time frame that we're aiming for in respect of the, the work we're discussing here. Um, Joran, we see your hand up, please. I just want to reiterate one of the things that, that Xavier was saying. 
um, a couple of first of all we brought this to the community together with the board we brought this to the community to have this discussion because uh, we believe that this is important for the, the community the general and the community to know about so yes we sort of forced the discussion but i think and i i like all the inputs and the, the vari varieties of views on this one because that's why we brought it uh sometimes when you bring things into the community you get you know, you get sort of, you get harsh comments back, like, why are you doing like this? Why are you doing that? We do this because we think we want to be transparent in the process that I think everybody's important. The, the, the second part, which I want to point out, is the, that this is something we are continue to do all the work. Yeah, you know, we, we can, we, we are not prioritizing prioritization over everything else. We are continuing to do what we're doing. SSAD, we're doing, we, we support the ICANN staff, the ICANN staff is supporting policy work. We are implementing stuff. Uh, we are, you know, we are doing compliance. We are doing all of those things uh, all the time. So, so it's not like we stop working and waiting for us to prioritize. We do a lot of work, and we are transparent about it. We have major project implementation of Workstream Two. We have uh, doing the SSAD. We have all of those things running right now. This is to create the mechanism for having a good conversation on a regular basis with the community, with the SOs and AC leadership, how to get the input to the board and other ones, how to make prioritization. Because everybody has, since I joined Jeff, everybody have said we need to start prioritization. Uh, we need to get, we, we, you know, we need to have a better transparency of this. So we are delivering the board and the org. And, and from the comments I get, you don't you don't i don't feel that you disagree with me on that notion uh but we i agree we have to do this right and that's why we're talking to you thanks Joran. sebastian over to you yes thank you very much i i just want to remind you the presentation we made at the beginning atrt suite came with five recommendations and there were priority prioritized because we were working under uh, the new rule of procedures of the reviews. And the ATRT, like other reviews, are the Im is the image of the community. Therefore, when, when you say we need to go back to the community, but we are, we were, ATRT3 was the community at that moment for that topic. And, and, and um, I, I have the impression that we are, uh, going in circle and, and, and rehashing some, some work. But I will stop here just to add one thing. ATRT3 came with a recommendation about prioritization. Therefore, it's not just uh, ICANN org and the board who push this discussion. It's also the community through ATRT3 participation. And, and, and therefore, it, it's important that we are all on the same page that we need prioritization, but we have to discuss which one we have to prioritize because ATRT was always um, supposed to be or was always the premius inter pares of the reviews and the one to be prioritized against every others. I am talking about reviews, not about the overall work of ICANN. Thank you very much. And, and sorry to be jump a little bit outside of uh, running this meeting, but fortunately, Iser is uh, here to do that for this part of the of the session. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. I, I think it's a good idea to bring us back to first principles, which is um, the the reason we're here. That that ATRT uh, recommendation set. Um, you're on. Your hand is up. We'll turn back to you. Sorry, I forgot to take it down. I'm going to be silent now. Old hand, as we like to say. And Seb, I believe you have an old hand as well. There we go. Uh, Christopher Wilkinson, please. Hi, good evening again. Christopher Wilkinson for the record. Um, two short comment, comments. Prioritization is or should be a straightforward management tool in relation to time delays and resources. What it is sometimes becoming in ICANN is a sort of um, repair tool for the failure of the multi-stakeholder model to produce consensus. Uh, I obviously, given my background, um, 
think of prioritization as a as a monetary uh, as a budgetary and uh, management tool and I think it should remain there um, on the question of um, consensus and PDPs versus versus management uh, structural and other reforms um, <laughs> allow me to say I'm only half joking to to Jeff that give me six significant amendments to the PDP report on subsequent procedures and I could support and I think I would carry a lot of the ALAC with me um, I could support um, the next round uh, next week but as long as uh, GNSO is entrenched in what internationally I consider to be totally unacceptable um, presumptions um, they are creating a significant delay in the whole procedure and the whole credibility of, uh, of ICANN. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Christopher. Um, are there any further thoughts on this point about, um, I, I, I suspect actually we've gotten into several different points here, but what kicked us off was the idea of prioritizing PDP work um, and uh, review work as, as two separate buckets. Are there any further thoughts or comments on this? If not, I'm going to turn to a question that I've uh, sort of gleaned from the chat. All right, I don't see anyone screaming to speak on, on this particular point. Um, so with that, what I might do is, is turn us to uh, sort of a synthesis of, of what we've asked, um, uh, of, of what's been said. In the previous session, uh, Leon, you raised an interesting point in your remarks. You said the holistic review is a bit controversial um, because of the suggestions of the pilot. I wonder, um, I've certainly heard many questions about the pilot, wanting to understand the pilot and, and what the purpose of the pilot is and the scope of the pilot and the timeline of the pilot. I wonder if we might explore these, it seems to be an, an opportune moment. Um, does anyone uh, have any questions, specific questions on the pilot? Um, do we have anyone who's, who would like to reflect perhaps um, uh, perhaps Pat or, or Cheryl or indeed um, org staff might like to reflect on, on the intentions as regards the pilot? Uh, perhaps Leon, you'd like to clarify your, your point. You, you said that the pilot was quite controversial. Um, any any questions, comments, concerns about the pilot? Now is a good time to air them. Uh, Marita, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think I think that there's a lot of confusion around the pilot, um, and as you said, we we ought to be trying to clarify some of that. I think a pilot should be a short term thing, which is very focused, very clear, and trying to pre present a roadmap as to how we address a larger problem. Uh, and and um, so I hope that's how this holistic pilot is being considered. But I, from everything I've heard, I'm, I'm getting a little confused. I, I don't know anymore. Thank you. Thanks, Marita. Um, and Holly, uh, over to you. I'll mute myself. Before we talk about how the pilot is going to run, I'd like to understand the question. I'd like to go back maybe to um, Pat's question, Patrick's question. Is this about the spaces between the various SOs and ACs and how we communicate? Are we looking at the question of Steve and um, sort of inter-organizational power structures? If it's a pilot, can we, can we agree on the question before we actually talk about process? Because my understanding of the original recommendation was, I think, addressed to the fact that we're silos, we don't necessarily talk, although when we have these sessions, we talk a lot. Um, is that 
communication um, enshrined in a process? Are there something in the structures that stop the communication? You know, Jeff's talking about we don't come to answers. I think we do. I think we can. So I guess I, I'd like to start with agreement on a question before we worry about process. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Holly. Um, uh, I think it would be very useful to the extent that we um, that we had someone who could comment on uh, the community involvement in scoping the pilot. My understanding was that the community would be invited to uh, to participate in that, but I'm not sure what the timeline or um, uh, status of that is. Um, Aubrey, I see you put your hand up, and I suspect it's on this precise point. So, Manal, please forgive me. I'm I'm going to turn to Aubrey. Thank you. This is Aubrey speaking. Um, and, and thank you. Yes, uh, the, the pilot and and whether a pilot is 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 a short lead in or not. That that is, for example, one of the reasons why wanting the community to discuss as a first part of this pilot on what the terms of reference are, what are the issues that are going to be covered adequately in the 18 months that this thing is supposed to last. Now, one of the reasons that it is a pilot is because the questions that are outstanding on it make it too difficult to sort of write up the bylaws that create this thing yet. So therefore a mechanism had to be created to, how do we have this holistic review? How do we set it up with full community participation from the beginning without already having something defined in the bylaws when we're still not quite ready to, to say what it is because it is still an evolving concept with the community. Yes, ATRT came out with its framing of what it would look like, but in the conversations even that we've seen today, nailing down the term of reference, nailing down the what are we going to be looking at is indeed a difficult first step in this pilot. So, so that's one of the reasons why it is a pilot. I don't think it'll be quicker. In fact, we aren't planning at this point, the community may come in differently for it to be shorter than the 18 months or longer than the 18 months. But to try and see, can a terms of reference be created by the community uh, of what needs to be covered in this first holistic? And as it goes through its process, we'll learn what needs to be written in the bylaws. And then the bylaws will go through their whole process of review, decision, and you know, EC approval. Thanks. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, Holly, I'm going to assume that's an old hand. Manal and Steve, uh, you're our uh, last hands up. I'm just mindful. I'd like to give Joran uh, five minutes to to conclude. So if I can uh, limit uh, Manal and Steve, if I can limit. I don't need. I don't need any time. Ah, splendid. All right. You're, you're, Joran has ceded his time. Um, with that, Manal, we'll turn to you. We'll just be mindful that we have seven minutes remaining, please. Uh, thank you, Heather, and thank you, Joran. I, I'll keep it short anyway. Just seeking confirmation to my understanding, because I think holistic, by definition, describes the scope of the pilot. And... I'm assuming that by pilot, we mean we're testing before fixation, but not that it is something on a smaller scale, or do I understand this strongly? Was I able to make my point clear? I mean, holistic by definition says that everything is going to be looked at at the same time. So I'm assuming that holistic already describes the scope of the pilot. But the term pilot here is that we're testing it before fixation. Um, did I get this right? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Manal. Um, Zavi has put in the chat, it's, it's what he understands. I suppose perhaps where the, the conversation is coming out in the chat and, and here in, in some of the speaker's comments is back to that earlier dialogue that we had about 
Um, is this the, the spaces in between um, the, uh, the SOs and ACs, the various groups in ICANN and how they work together, or is this the, the sort of internal processes of, of those groups? I think that's what's unclear. I think we can all agree that holistic, we understand the, the meaning of holistic as, as that sort of macro level, that it, that it, it covers everything. Um, but I, I think it's probably unclear as to exactly what everything is. Um, uh, with that, uh, Sebastian, I see you've put up your hand. Um, we'll turn to you, but we'll give uh, uh, Steve Del Bianco some time as well, please. Start, start with him and I will be at the end. Thank you. All right, Steve, over to you. Thank you, Steve Del Bianco. I would uh, recommend that we not pursue the third organizational review for GNSO until after the holistic review. Since even if the holistic review looks only at the spaces of in between, the interactions, the holistic review can ask GAC, ALAC, and SSAC whether the mechanisms for their interaction with the policies that emerge from GNSO are mechanisms that adequately reflect their input on the public interest at policies that come out of GNSO. So that's just an example of where we should do the holistic review, even if it is narrowly scoped to the spaces between and the interactions, and that will inform what some of the priorities would be in a GNSO review, which would ordinarily not even talk to anybody outside of GNSO. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, Seb, let's give you the, the last word, please. Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to come back to the ATRT3 uh, recommendation. Uh, and I will not read to you, but I, I feel that uh, it's really the summarize, uh, summarizing this situation in two sentences at the beginning of this meeting or what we are hearing here. It seems that we are forgetting what the aim and the work done by this team during uh, this uh, uh, one year uh, and, and not just, uh, we don't just discuss about holistic review, but there's something written in the ATRT who is not just say it's a review, holistic, we need to be the first and uh, in 18 months, there are much more in, in the content and it must be useful to, to have a, a in-depth uh, knowledge of that and discussion. Uh, I understand why the board came with a pilot. It's avoid the necessity to change the bylaw and it's a way to do it uh, before changing the bylaws. Therefore, why not to start with this discussion to see how we can do the next step and it will be very good. I will stop here. I will not, I don't want to have the last word. I don't, yeah, we have two minutes. I, I really want to 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 have Joran taking uh, this, uh, this last word. I would like to thank you very much all for participating, all these great exchanges. And I hope that it will be useful for ICANN and therefore for all of us. Thank you very much. Um, I give you back the floor, Isa. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, Joran, um, I believe Seb is, is invoking your name here. Um, uh, whether or not you would like to give final remarks, I think Seb would like you to. No, I, I, yes, I, I really appreciate this discussion and I appreciate all the um, all the interactions with this. I have nothing more to say that I truly enjoy this, as I often do. Sebastian, technically that, that counts as final remarks we, from the CEO. Yeah, <laughs> that's great, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, we, we appreciate a lot of your participation. I hope that it was uh, useful. I just, I would say a last word, it could have been uh, a public session during the ICANN meeting next week. Uh, I think the topic would have been uh, useful for everybody, but I hope that uh, the organization by ALAC and at large was uh, good enough and that, and thank you for your participation. Uh, we hope to see you during the ICANN meeting. And I guess that there is a, another session from our friend from Naralo starting in a few minutes. Please come, it will be um, trivia session and something different that we have done here, but, but very useful too for our health. And take care of every one of you and see you soon. Ezra, thank you for your help and thank you all for participating.